The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? By assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners, by offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace, the institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, national security, health care, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-volunteer army, the flat tax, the Taylor rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derived from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead, informing the marketplace of ideas, advising the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. There's census when we look at U.S. public opinion polls that U.S. education has to improve. But immediately, when we get past that overview, we see that the consensus breaks down. Over the last half century, we've actually quadrupled the spending per pupil on US students. And at the same time, math and science performance of our students has been constant since the 1970s. On top of that, the gap between kids from disadvantaged families and more advantaged families in terms of achievement has not moved over the same time period. You ask, how could that be? It turns out that there are a number of forces that lead to this inertia in our education policy. 
at the top of the list is probably complacency, where people say, well, do we really have to change what's going on in our schools? After that comes self-interest, comes ideology, and whether we know what to do or not. A group of scholars at Hoover has been addressing these problems for some time and trying to figure out how to cut the Gordian knot that surrounds US education policy. And that's the subject of this talk. It may seem odd, but the field of education policy research is actually about two decades behind other policy fields. In fact, it's only been in the last 15 years or so that there's been a clear understanding even of what the standards of evidence are. And so for decades, there's been research done in education that hasn't actually been uh, good enough for us to know what's going on. So against that backdrop, it's really amazing that we have social scientists and fellows at Hoover who bring rigorous understanding of economics, of political science, of public policy and public administration, and they're able to do things like look at institutional relationships to figure out what drivers of policy are and how they can be moved through public decision making, or how public opinion shapes the debate in public policy, or how individual kinds of reform efforts make or don't make better outcomes for kids. These are incredibly important contributions that Hoover scholars are making to the debate today. With all of the conflict that exists around education policy, it is hard to know how to change it. The view of the Hoover scholars is that solid scientific research and evaluation can put us on the correct path. Welcome. I'm Eric Wakin, the deputy director of the Hoover Institution and the director of its library and archives. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth, excuse me, sixth session of our centennial speaker series entitled The Century of Ideas for a Free Society. This series features 11 panel discussions over the course of the year to showcase the rigorous scholarship and research central to the institution's mission and values. Today's discussion is titled Changing the Education Debate and it will focus on the challenges surrounding education reform and the impact of research and analysis related to this continuing policy debate. The participants of today's panel are Rick Hanischek. Rick is the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow and member of the Correct Task Force on K-12 Education at the Hoover Institution. Rick is a leader in the development of the economic analysis of educational issues, and his research spans the impact on achievement of teacher quality, high-stakes accountability, and class size reduction. Rick pioneered measuring teacher quality on the basis of student achievement, which is the foundation for current research into value-added evaluations of teachers and schools. Terry Moe. Terry is a senior fellow and a member of the Correct Task Force on K-12 Education at the Hoover Institution, and also the William Bennett Monroe Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. Terry has written extensively on the politics and reform excuse me, on the politics and reform of American education. His book with John Chubb, Politics, Markets, and America's Schools, is among the most influential and controversial works on education to be published during the last two decades. It shows how, the, how po politics shapes and undermines the public schools and argues for the value of school choice. Mackie Raymond. Mackie is a distinguished research fellow and a member of the Correct Task Force on K-12 education as well. Mackie has served as a founder and director of the Center for Research on Educational Outcomes, known as Credo, at Stanford University since its inception in 1999. The Credo team conducts rigorous and independent analysis and evaluation of promising programs that aim to improve outcomes for students in US K-12 public schools. Their mantra is, we let the data speak. The team conducts large-scale analyses under collaboration with 30 state education agencies. Finally, our moderator is Robert Pondisco, a senior fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Robert writes and speaks extensively in education and education reform issues with an emphasis on literacy, civics, curriculum, teaching, and urban education. After 20 years in journalism, Robert became a fifth grade teacher at a struggling South Bronx public school in 2002. He has a book coming out in September titled How the Other Half Learns, based on New York City's Success Academy Charter School Network. Please. Join me in welcoming this esteemed group to the stage.
Good afternoon. I should be a teacher say, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I kid. Uh, I'm Robert Pondicio, a senior fellow uh, at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, which is an education policy think tank based in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm also a former fifth grade teacher at PS 277 in the South Bronx. Our discussion today is changing the education debate, an idea I am wholly in favor of. Uh, education in America is a $700 billion industry comprising 14,000 school districts, 100,000 schools, and employing some 3.7 million full-time school teachers. Uh, everybody accepts that improving schools is important, but that consensus breaks down at that point. And to be candid, I'm not even sure we agree on that. Uh, some will argue that schools are a reflection of problems at work in society at large, of racism, of poverty, of inequality, and when those are addressed, education outcomes will improve. Uh, what cannot be denied, however, is that schooling is very different, a very different thing today than it was for previous generations of Americans. And the three scholars with me have their thumbprints all over those changes. They represent Hoover scholars who've been thinking about education for a very long time. Hoover has played an outsized role in shaping our often contentious, contentious education debate, uh, fighting above its weight given its size. Now, compared to our esteemed panelists, I'm a relative newcomer to this work. I became a fifth grade teacher in 2002 in the South Bronx. That was the year, if I can re uh, recall correctly, that uh, No Child Left Behind took effect, functionally enshrining testing and accountability as the operating principle for every American public school. Uh, but when I have the pleasure of speaking to those who've been doing this work longer than I have, I like to go back even further to the 1983 A Nation at Risk report. Uh, it warned darkly, if you remember the wonderful language there, about a rising tide of mediocrity in, Americans, in America's schools and observing that, quote, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. Well, that was 35 years ago. There were no charter schools. There was no standards movement. There was no testing and accountability regime. So I think it's instructive to recapture the sense of urgency of a nation at risk, but also to ask, does American education in 2019 look the way we thought it would look 35 years ago? Uh, so that is a guiding question for this discussion. Uh, but to start us off, I'm gonna go down the line and ask each of you, what do you think the biggest change has been in education in the last 20 years? Terry Moe, start us off. All right, um, well, I think the most important thing that's happened is that we've had a dramatic change in the politics of education. Um, one reason is that we have a president who apparently doesn't care about education. Uh, education is not really on his agenda. He never talks about it. Um, and if you compare this to the role that education played in the Obama administration, or the George W. Bush administration, or the Clinton administration, or the George H. W. Bush administration, uh, this is really stunningly different. Right? All of a sudden, education has been pushed uh, to the periphery. So another thing uh, that's different is that, uh, okay, since about 1990, the two uh, major reform movements have been the school reform movement and uh, the school accountability movement. Um, uh, both of those in recent years have taken big hits. Uh, when it comes to school choice, uh, uh, Donald Trump has embraced school choice. He hasn't pursued it, but he's embraced it, right? He, and he uh, appointed uh, Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education. She's a big school choice person. And the result of that, uh, one result is that uh, the reformers, education reformers within the Democratic Party, and there are, are many, um, have seen that as a real uh, toxic thing. School choice has been sort of stigmatized lately, and the people who used to like, lead the reform movement uh, within the Democratic Party have backed off. Uh, uh, and this is really important because in the past, um, uh, it wasn't just Republicans because, you know, they're, they're not beholden to the teachers' unions. They can do what they want in, in education pretty much, uh, but it wasn't enough. And the, the, the key driver, really, of 
uh, school choice was that there were democratic groups like De uh, Democrats for Education Reform uh, that were pushing this thing forward on the democratic side and trying to empower minority uh, uh, and low-income parents. And uh, uh, that was a big deal. Uh, now, those people have backed off. Also, if you think about the Obama administration with Arne Duncan and Race to the Top, this was a major thing and they're Democrats, right? So Democrats were really important in pushing school choice. And now, look at what the Democratic candidates for the presidency are doing. Even Cory Booker, who used to be a big mm. supporter of school choice, is backing off. He doesn't even really want to talk about charter schools. This is a big thing, you know? So politics now is really different on choice. And uh, as a result, it's made it much more different. So if I have one more minute, I'll Please. talk for a second about account accountability. That's uh, a little bit different. Um, all right. So no offense to anybody, but uh, um, over the past 10 years or so, Republicans have become much more extreme uh, ideologically. Um, and it, uh, not so long ago, Republicans were voting for No Child Left Behind. Uh, uh, which was passed by George W. Bush, a Republican president, who was seeking to set up a uniform system of accountability for the nation as a whole, pre precisely because we didn't have one and we needed something like that uh, for the country as a whole. But as Republicans became more and more ideologically extreme over the years, they began to see No Child Left Behind as uh, an unacceptable federal overreach and what they insisted upon was a devolution to state and local governments. All right, the ultimate result of that was uh, that NCLB got uh, torpedoed uh, and replaced by um, uh, uh, ESSA. Um, and ESSA devolves responsibility for accountability to state and local governments. Um, uh, Republicans like that. Um, uh, unfortunately, the teachers unions love it too, right? And the main opponents to school reform, including accountability and choice, are most powerful at the state and local level. They're least powerful at the national level. And so what Republicans really did was to hand a big gift to the teachers unions who supported that legislation because they know they're in a position to substantially weaken accountability in the 50 states, precisely because it's been devolved to those levels, right? So I think, you know, there are reasons why Republicans might favor getting away from, from federal control and moving towards state and local control, but in this case, I think it's gonna to lead to a big weakening of accountability efforts. Becky, okay. biggest change in the last 20 years from where you sit? Sure, so I'll go back actually to No Child Left Behind as well. Uh, and for me, the big change that that introduced was that we shifted our focus from looking at what schools did for inputs or what skills schools did during the day to what actually kids learn. And the focus on outcomes, specifically student outcomes, was the big revolution of No Child Left Behind, in my opinion. Uh, that coupled with the responsibility of actually measuring what kids know on a regular basis in the United States, which is different than any other country in the world in terms of how frequently we assess learning, uh, has given us the ability to be very, very clear about which students are actually learning and which students are not. And under No Child Left Behind, schools were required and states were required to report out on the progress of various groups of students. So blacks and Hispanics and, minor and low income students suddenly are under the spotlight on their own as opposed to have been averaged in with everybody else. And what this revealed is huge differences in achievement and huge differences in how much learning kids make even in a year's time. And that kind of transparency has been coupled with the accountability movement, supposedly. I would argue the accountability movement never worked in the United States. It has mm -hmm. never been an effective tool. 
But what it has done is it's empowered districts and school boards and funders, philanthropies, and parents to say, you need to explain why my kid or our group or our community is not being educated the same as the kids across town. Those are very, very powerful levers for change. And we can see in cities across the country that those gaps are the ones that are receiving the most attention now, and it's taken us 15 years to get there. I think that's a huge change, and I think that will determine much of what we see in the policy evolution in the decade to come. Eric. Well, <clears throat> I'll pick up on what Mackie was saying, that one of the biggest changes that we've seen over this time period is not paying all the attention to how much do we spend on schools or what the teachers look like and so forth, but in fact to moving attention to the performance of students. And in fact, that's become the current fight about whether we should even measure the performance of students. People have argued strenuously that the existing state tests at a low level aren't very worthwhile. We, nobody needs to know what's on the state test and that we shouldn't uh, pay attention to them. The answer is those tests measure skills that are valuable to individuals. In particular, people that know more as measured by these tests actually do much better in the labor market than people who know less. More importantly, perhaps, for the nation is that nations where the people know more, are more skilled, actually grow faster than nations where the uh, people know less. This is basically a simple statement that the quality of the labor force is what determines long-run growth around the world. And in that regard, we're falling behind. Now, coming back. That's a long way of getting to the point of what's the biggest change in the last 20 years. The biggest change in the last 20 years is no change. Mm. The biggest difference is that as we measure performance, um, today the math skills of our 17-year-olds are exactly equal to the math performance of 17-year-olds in 1972. Mm -hmm. Um, regardless of what we've done, and we have all kinds of fights about what we're doing different in schools today and so forth, but if you're an output-focused guy, you say that we haven't seen any change. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I, I always say that 17-year-old Nate looks like a dead man's EKG. It has just <laughs> not moved. Um, I'm just going to invoke moderator's privilege to just give my own opinion of what I think the biggest change in education, and I'm going to be the person here who speaks from the vantage point of a classroom teacher. Uh, and I would argue that this has been a achievement, if there's been one, for ed reform at large, which is it has, been, it has become morally inappropriate to hold children to, difference, to lower or different standards. Um, and I don't think that you can underestimate what a sea change that is in professional practice. I'm not saying we always honor that, but we cannot say that anymore. It is, it is, it is, a, it is an inappropriate opinion. Uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations, as it were. But, be, but before we move on, I want to ask Terry Moe, I want to challenge you, frankly, on, on something you just said, uh, where, where you were sounding a, a caution about softening accountability and political extremism, and this is why we're, we're, we're backtracking on accountability. Isn't there another possibility, which is that people just don't like this stuff? They don't like having their children's education dominated by testing and whatnot. And there's a bit of an immune response on the part of some parents. Couldn't that be driving some of the discontent as well? Yeah, it always has. But I, I don't think that the opposition has come from ordinary people uh, so much as it has come from uh, teachers unions and school boards. Um, if you look at the polls, ordinary people are very much in favor of accountability. Um, that's, that's not the problem. Uh, I think the problem has always been um, that, uh, look, teachers unions are in the business of representing the job interests of their members. Um, that's not a criticism of the unions, it's just what unions do, right? It's what you would expect them to do. Um, and uh, accountability is just uh, 
a real infringement on the accountability, or excuse me, the autonomy of teachers to do their own thing, which they always did before the accountability <laughs> era came in. And so that's sort of the ideal, to like leave teachers alone, let teachers do their thing in the classroom. And having accountability imposed from above is a real negative for the teachers' unions, and the vast majority of school districts don't like it. Uh, traditionally, they've been in control of what happens in their schools, and now they have the state and maybe the federal government telling them what to do. They don't like that. So they've been resisting it. Ever since No Child Left Behind came in, they have been resisting it. There's been a huge public relations campaign massive lobbying efforts, lots of power being exercised. And nonetheless, accountability sort of inched along and you know, Obama took it up in a big way and tried to advance it. But as I said, I, I think uh, the politics has shifted and made it even more difficult uh, for accountability to make progress in the future. Hmm. I have to say that the, the logic of accountability, maybe we're just interpreting it differently, so correct me if I've got this wrong, it feels to me like the, the internal logic of accountability has always been, look, schools and teachers, you know what to do, now we're gonna hold you accountable for doing it. Uh, so it's slightly news to me to hear that, that this is an infringement on teachers' autonomy. My assumption has been all along that, oh, we assume you know what to do and now we're just gonna hold you accountable for doing it. That's a, that's a nuanced difference, I, but it's a critical one. I think holding teachers accountable for doing it is enormous and a, a major break from the past, right? Also, sure. um, there was never data on how individual teachers did in actually teaching their kids, and that's the last thing that the teachers' unions want to have happen. They've done everything they can to prevent the collection of data that links student performance to the performance of actual teachers in the classroom, right? So these things are incendiary as far as they're concerned, and they've tried to oppose it all the way. Sure. Um, so let, let's get back on track. So uh, what policies have been suggested by the research that we have seen in the last 20 years, either that we are doing and not doing well or that we're not doing at all? Mackie, why don't you take that one? Well, I'm probably going to be branded as a heretic here at the Hoover Institution of War, Revolution, and Peace by what I'm about to say. But um, I think that there has been a strong assumption in the school choice movement that somehow markets are going to be a magical mechanism for quality mm -hmm. improvement. And I want to say, uh, because our mantra is we let the data speak, we see consistently over the last 25 years that there is a substantial proportion of schools who have autonomy, who are subject to accountability only at the end of their charter term, that are not able to produce quality, and they still enroll students year after year after year. There's a second layer there about accountability not particularly working well in terms of closing bad charter schools, which I think everyone in this room would agree is a good idea. But the point that I'm making is even without the, the accountability function kicking in and closing those schools, the market isn't working that families are still interested in enrolling their kids in these schools, even in the light of performance data made available to them, they continue to enroll their kids. You might say, well, that just means that they're sorting or they're choosing on a lot of other, other criteria. I think that's great. That's why I think accountability and, and parental choice have to go hand in hand, because it's not okay to trade off a child's economic future for the idea that they may be more entertained during a school day. So for me, there's no market mechanism that can clear bad charter schools in the way that we need to, and that's why the accountability and, and regulatory function has to be there as a backstop. Because we're not asking parents to support their kids for the rest of their lives, but they're making decisions that make those kids' futures very vulnerable. Hmm. Anybody want to defend the market? I don't know, I want to pile on. <laughs> so, Sorry, this is Hoover, so, right? Yeah, it, okay, it is. Checking. I'll defend the market. But, I, I mean, I, I think that it's extraordinarily valuable to give choice to poor kids that don't have choice otherwise. And we would like them to make better, some parents to make better choices in terms of the math performance of their kids. 
but they also are getting lots of value out of these choices in many instances because the alternative is not very good and it's not very safe. And so maybe they're just getting a safe place, whatever. Um, but I don't want to start by assuming that parents are absolutely stupid. Um, I think that they're making choices, um, maybe not the same ones that we would make, or maybe not the same mm -hmm. ones we would want them to make. I, I agree with my panelists that we can't avoid accountability and regulatory uh, regimes, but um, I don't think we should go so far as the, to uh, castigate all but these choices. Is there a case to be made that uh, the way we practice testing and accountability has had something of a homogenizing effect on schools, that we may be different, different flavors in different locations, but we're all chasing those test scores now? Well, I don't know that the results are homogeneous uh, in any sense. We, we haven't got that. We have emphasized that it's really important that kids know how to read and do basic math, and I think that's true. Uh, that's what accountability says, and I, but I think that's the reality that to uh, survive in society, you have to be able to be able to read and do basic math or you're not going to survive in a very solid economic sense. I hope that's an uncontroversial point, but I'm always surprised. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with what Rick is saying, um, but also with what Mackie is saying. I mean, Excellent. look, look. Yeah. I think you have to choose. <laughs> so, look. Um, that's how we survive I, around here. We yeah, agree yeah. with each other. Yeah. We don't really believe anything. We just compromise. So, so like, I, I think the easiest thing to do is to just start with free market thinking, right? And, and, which is very powerful. And so you would expect that if, if people have choices uh, in an education system, they're going to choose the best schools um, to the extent they can. Um, and so that means that bad schools are going to go out of business because they're going to be able to attract uh, the kids they need to stay in business. Uh, well. Okay, that sounds good. That's a powerful logic. The question is, is it true? The answer is no. You know, and we know that because people like Mackey, and especially Mackey, have carried out comprehensive studies that show that there are actually a reasonably large number of charter schools that are bad. And they're bad because parents continue to go there. Right? And so what happens is that you have this very promising population of charter schools that is weighed down by this lower tail consisting of bad schools. They don't need to be there. And you could regulate them out of existence. You could say, if you're bad, you're out. Right? And so what you need is a regulatory structure, right? and then there are some free market people who just can't handle that. Right? And what I would say is, too bad. You know, I hope you lose in the politics of this because to make markets work, markets are just these wonderful, powerful things. It's just great that we have them available to us, but to think that we can just turn them loose and wish everybody good luck, I think, is a mistake. What you need to do, which we do in the economy, is to have a regulatory structure, hopefully not an onerous one, that recognizes the problems that are involved, potentially, with markets and adjust for them so that the markets work the way we want them to work. And in this case, if parents continue to patronize bad schools, meaning that their children are suffering, we should say, you can't do that. We're going to eliminate these bad schools and open up the supply side as much as possible so that we get a better and better population of schools where the good schools stay, the bad schools get eliminated, and the population as a whole moves ahead. Where do non-academic factors uh, enter into this thinking? And I, this is, this is a, a hint of this when we were in the green room before coming out. I worked in what I, I think all of you would agree was a terrible school, a, a terrible public school in the South Bronx. Uh, less than one out of five of the kids was reading on grade level, but it was also a rather humane school. Would, would it be one that would, I would be satisfied for my own daughter? Candidly not. 
uh, but it was safe. Uh, the principal spoke fluent Spanish, knew every parent by name. Uh, it, it had a good community school flavor to it. And I'm not sure that, she, and frankly, uh, I'm telling stories out of school, literally. I, I, w I was a fifth grade teacher, and I remember t uh, trying to persuade parents of mine who had younger siblings. I told them, hey, you know, there's a really great KIPP school down the road, which is the best school in the South Bronx, so you should enter that lottery for your fourth grader. And in five years, only one kid ever did. I'm not sure what to make of that. So I don't see why you suggest that there's necessarily a trade-off be between having a humane school and one that actually teaches. Um, I don't think we, that there should be, but I wasn't the one making the decision. Well, what did, when back to your original question about what has research said in the last 20 years that's been uh, sort of most important or had, had the biggest impact, and where I would say it is is the pointing out the value of effective teachers versus ineffective teachers and to sort of emphasize the fact that there's a distribution of teacher quality out there that is really quite large. So that um, a study I did a long time ago in Gary, Indiana, which used to produce steel when the US produced steel, hmm. um, all poor kids, all uh, racially, uh, racial minority kids in the school, one set of teachers got a year and a half worth of learning every year. Another set of teachers got half a year of learning every year. So depending upon which classroom you're assigned in, you could end up a full year difference in terms of what you knew. Um, and we now, I think, believe that quite generally and know that. Um, so that the research has emphasized the importance of quality teaching. What hasn't happened is that policy has generally moved to take that into account and to use that information in making decisions so that the set of teachers who are getting half a year worth of learning, if they haven't retired already, are still there. Um, and we don't make any distinctions of, about that. And that's what it led to one of the current biggest fights that is in the newspapers all the time is how do you evaluate teachers because we have to have a fair evaluation system in order to make distinctions. In my opinion, it, yes, we need a fair evaluation system, but there's no mystery about who the good teachers are and who the poor teachers are. Everybody in this room has gone through extensive amounts of schooling, and you can think back very easily and remember you had some really good teachers and you had some really bad teachers. And there's not a person in this room, I assert, that wouldn't say, well, I had some bad teachers along the way. That's the breaks, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a, a set of policies that tries to take that into account. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're, we're starting to depress ourselves, I think, <laughs> with, with, our, with our lack of progress. So let's, let's see if we can turn and be a little bit more optimistic. Um, what are the changes, the like, Okay, let's say like, maybe likely is not the right word because what are the changes either that you consider to be likely to see over the next 20 years or that you think we ought to see? I'll, you, you can choose your own adventure. Dr. Hanisha, go ahead. Oh, well, I'll follow on just what I was saying. One of the things that we've seen recently is that um, 39 states now require uh, that local schools take into account student performance in their evaluation of teachers, in the evaluation, not in the, what they do with them, but in the evaluation. Um, the policies I would like to see is that evaluations become part of the uh, personnel systems and are used in making decisions about pay and retention and so forth of teachers. Is that likely? There are a few signs that it might be likely. Uh, 
most of you probably don't realize it, but Washington DC schools are some of the most innovative schools in the country in the sense that they have an extensive evaluation system that yields large bonuses to the best teachers. The best teachers can have their salaries, their base salary increased by $25,000 a year when the average is about 65,000. So it's a big amount. And over the last six years, Washington DC has fired 500 teachers. Um, and it shows up. The school system is still not a high performing system. It stands out for a long way to move in terms of student achievement. But it has improved more than any other urban school system in the country. Will that carry, carry through to other places? Dallas, Texas is trying something, but there are 14,000 school districts in the country and only a minority are following the Washington DC model. Mm -hmm. Terry Mill, what's in your crystal ball? Well, um, I hate to rain on everybody's parade. This You've been is, doing I, it so successfully. my here, so I you know, <laughs> may as well do it. Um, <laughs> Look, Washington DC is unusual. Uh, I, I think uh, you know the stars lined up there, and Michelle Ray, Ray was able to accomplish this big uh, uh, victory over union opposition. Uh, but that's not the norm. Uh, uh, I think what happens is that you try to adopt these teacher evaluation systems, and uh, uh, it's a struggle. And often the unions are able to participate in devising these systems. And a number of states have mandated them. And the result is that uh, after a number of years of doing this, almost all teachers remain satisfactory. Mm -hmm. What do you know? <laughs> you know, now why is that? Well, there are all kinds of pressures to do that. Um, you know, there are pressures at the state level, really powerful pressures, not to make this onerous for teachers. And at the local level, you know, principals aren't, and uh, uh, superintendents aren't looking for trouble. You know, they don't want to create conflict. They don't like this in many cases. You know, some do, but almost all of them don't. And so if you think you're going to get uh, really accurate evaluations that then allow you to move teachers out of the classroom who are bad, I think that's a pipe dream. It's also a pipe dream because there are tons of state laws that make it virtually impossible to actually get rid of anybody. And those are supplemented by provisions within collective bargaining contracts that make it even harder to do that. And so this is a very, very difficult process just doing like this one thing that everybody can agree needs to be done, which is that if there are teachers who are not good in the classroom, there are real kids in those classrooms. They're not learning anything. Their lives are being ruined, right? Then we should get those teachers out of the classroom. Well, you can't do that. It's very hard to do that. That is the reality, and it's a reality that's rooted in power and in interests. And so really what we have is this clash of sort of social science and the ideas of social science, which are often just really good and well-documented, and the realities of politics where the power players don't care what social scientists find and have no intention of following those recommendations because they are threatening to those interests. That's the fundamental dilemma at the heart of education reform. Hmm. That is such a sad thing to follow. <laughs> I was about to walk off. Yeah, well, okay. Well, let me let me gather my thoughts. <laughs> I actually think I'm a little bit more optimistic than that, um, and and in sort of a gleeful and subversive way. So join me in being gleeful and subversive. Um, first off, I think a lot of these systems collapse under their own weight. Hmm. And I look forward to that. We are starting to see that in district insolvency. We're starting to see that in collective bargaining agreements that just run right off the cliff. That's happening in Los Angeles now. Uh, I think we start to see a bunch of things that say the status quo is not sustainable. 
And at the same time, we start to see a diversification of the kinds of providers of education. And I don't just mean charter schools or private schools and traditional public schools or magnet schools. We're really seeing a huge proliferation of different avenues for getting education. And it may not happen at the elementary level, and it may not happen in middle school. But when you look and see what's happening in high schools across the country with the incredible um, uh, diversity of personalized learning and exploratory learning and internship-based, place-based education and different providers coming in and providing career and technical education. What's happening here is that there are outside providers who are chipping away at the foundations of the education establishment in districts. And I find that very encouraging. I think it's going to be a complete mess for a couple of decades. But I do think that the idea here is that we are seeing active engagement in trying to do different things for kids. And because that is finding toeholds, handholds, I'm actually encouraged that eventually districts are going to have to become much, much more responsive to producing results for kids because families and other providers are starting to demand it. And so I'm more optimistic than my colleagues here. I'm also younger, so I can stick around and watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm neither an economist nor a political scientist nor a researcher. M my own answer to my own question uh, from a teacher perspective uh, would be I wish we'd spent the last 35 years focusing on improving practice, classroom practice. I, I alluded to this before. In other words, my school where I used to teach, uh, and again, statistically, not a good school whatsoever. That school, and I think this is important to say, was not filled with people who were necessarily bad teachers. It was filled with people who were trying hard and failing. And, and significantly, they were, they were failing not despite their training, but because of it. In other words, this was the logic of accountability I was referring to. If, if the logic is, you know what to do, now we're going to hold you accountable for doing it, I always tend to say, where'd you get that idea? We, we are not well trained to do what we do. Um, so, I mean, and maybe this is a delicate question to ask in, on a university campus, but where are the ed schools? Why are we not talking about them? Why aren't we talking about them? We're going to get ourselves in so, more, more trouble. So if we look at the research on teacher effectiveness, which there's quite a bit now, a large part of it has tried to decide what are the characteristics, the background, the behaviors that in fact lead to some people to be more effective than others. And this research has been a complete failure. It has not identified anything that in fact is related to the effectiveness of teachers. So having a master's degree gives no information I can attest to that personally. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> um, having more experience after the first few years in the classroom has no impact. So a 25th year teacher on average is as effective as a fifth year teacher. Um, where you went to school and the kind of school you went to has no effect. And the, the great hope of many school people is that through professional development and training, we can take a not too good teacher and make her a really good teacher. Um, all of the attempts in general at using broad scale professional development have failed. Um, so I don't, so coming back to the question, where are the ed schools? You can see why it's a really tough problem that ed schools have. If you don't know what you should be producing, how do you design the curriculum and the training program to produce what you don't know? Um, so in this regard, maybe we shouldn't bash ed schools so much, um, but they're in some sense irrelevant in my uh, mind. Um, in that they are not, in fact, systematically producing people that are better on average than 
the non-ed schools. Yeah, I'm going to push back a little bit on that. My master's degree is in elementary education. I was an elementary school teacher. You would think that if my ed school was going to prepare me for anything, it would be teach me how to teach kids how to read, especially since I was going okay. to teach in a school where four out of five uh, kids could not. That was not part of my ed school curriculum. I'm a New York State certified elementary school teacher who nobody thought it important to teach how to teach reading. That's a problem, if I may dabble so, in understatement. So they could be a little bit more focused, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could add a little bit more focus. To they cared about school. my disposition and my immortal but, soul, but not about teaching well, reading. What I'm trying to suggest is, at least given the population that they're now attracting to go into the ed schools, they are not systematically, even with focus, producing people that are uniformly very effect, uniformly effective. We have all kinds of certification requirements of what it takes to be a certified teacher, and you have your New York State uh, teaching credentials, but these credentials identify factors that are unrelated to effectiveness in the classroom. Right. So you might ask, why do we have all of this apparatus when in fact it is not leading to more effective uh, teachers. In fact, the normal view is that there, this is putting a floor on the quality of teaching, but I think in reality it's putting a ceiling on the quality of hmm. teaching by having all these certification requirements. Yeah. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we're going to throw it to you all for your questions, so get ready. Um, Can let, I just uh, zero please. in on this? I'm sorry. Um, this is going to sound like a gratuitous plug for Mr. Pondicio's book, uh, which is out, coming out? September 10th. September 10th. But pre-order on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. He's writing about Success Academies, which is uh, a group of over 50 charter schools in New York City. And I don't know if you have read in a various mainstream media print media, uh, the sort of exposés about Success Academy. But Success Academy seems to have cracked the code on a few things about getting teaching right. And Robert's book actually delves into what's good about that and what's bad about that. The thing that I find most compelling about the Success Academy model is that they start with the assumption that people are well-intentioned and ill-prepared to teach. And they are unapologetic about that perspective. And they have rigorously over several decades fine-tuned what they consider to be effective teaching practice. And they actually hold every single teacher to that standard. They give them lots of coaching, huge amounts of coaching. And Robert, maybe you could just say a few words about what scope of involvement teachers' professional development and coaching goes through in uh, success. Thanks for teeing that up. I'll make this very, very quick. There, there's one thing, you know, we, we study charter schools, right, to see what are the lessons that we can learn that are transferable to K-12 education at large. I think Success Academy fans and cheerleaders will be disappointed that I only really come up with one. Uh, it's a complicated place. A lot of it has to do with school culture and, and, and parent self-selection into the schools. But the one thing that they do exceptionally well, and this is a bit of confirmation bias, I'll confess on, on my part, because I've thought this would be a good idea for a long time. If you think about the teacher's job, uh, and by the way, this is, there was a RAND study in 2016 that showed that um, literally, almost literally every teacher in America goes on, online to look for resources and lesson plans, 98%, I think. And the, the, the number one resource was Google. The second one was Pinterest. So ask your child's teacher if they are going on Google and Pinterest to look for lessons and resources. If they say no, they are lying. Um, <laughs> just, it just is. So, so the teacher's job is divided, basically every American teacher's job is divided into two big buckets. There is lesson um, delivery, classroom teaching, et cetera. And then there's lesson development. Those are two very, very different skills. Um, and we don't prepare teachers to do either one particularly well. 
But when, put it this way, the, the one fixed quantity is time. There's 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. That cannot change. If a teacher is spending 10, 20, 30 hours a week on Google and Pinterest with the empty lesson plan by her elbow asking, what am I going to teach tomorrow? That is not a good use of time. So at Success Academy, even though their flavor of curriculum might not be my particular first choice, it changes the job when your, your preparation work is intellectual preparation, when it's questioning strategy, when it's practicing the lesson, when it's studying student work, when it's developing relationships with children, when it's everything other than going on Google and Pinterest. It, it, it enables relative neophytes to become fairly skilled fairly quickly, and that's a, that's a good model. Uh, for, for American education at large. I, I think there's a culture of education that suggests uh, we worship to a perhaps unhealthy degree at the idea, at the, at the, the, the altar of teacher autonomy. By the way, when I, when I tell this to audiences of teachers and say, your job is too hard, I expect to get challenged on, on autonomy, teachers are generally like, thank God somebody's finally saying this. My job is too hard. So that's, I think, the big takeaway from success. Before we throw it to, to, to audience questions, um, and let's try to make this one quick. I was going to ask if you're optimistic or pessimistic for the future of education. I think we've all agreed that we're pessimistic. Um, so find, maybe Mackie, you're, you're an exception. Uh, let's give folks some, some reason for cheer and optimism here. What, sh what can we be optimistic about in the next 20 years in ed policy? You're starting with me. Okay, if you prefer. <laughs> He's got to come up with something. <laughs> um, I'm not optimistic. Uh, okay. You know, what can I say? I can't I, make you be optimistic. All right, look, I, I, I think as things now stand, uh, Republicans are extreme. Um, and, you know, I don't say that to, to criticize Republicans. It sounds critical, right? Uh, a little bit. Uh, but uh, the political science research shows that polarization has been asymmetric. Uh, that the republic, you know, it hasn't just been both parties moving away uh, equidistant from the center. It has been the Republicans moving away much further from the center. Right? They're much more ideologically homogeneous than the Democrats are. The Democrats you know, uh, are much more diverse and eclectic. Yeah, they have, uh, they're Bernie Sanders and he's a socialist and, you know, you get the impression, if you listen to Fox News, that they're all socialists. Well, they're not, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more diverse party and Republicans really have become much more extreme over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And so I think uh, to the extent they are now interested in education reform at all, and I'm not convinced that they are, um, I think that they will be pushing school choice, but they will be pushing a much more free market version of it. Um, I like markets as much as the next guy, but I, I think that uh, uh, the success of a choice system really depends upon the kind of structure it, it's placed in and the kinds of basic rules that guarantee you know, equity and, and how the money is spent through audits uh, uh, and uh, a, a curriculum that must be taught and, and tests that must be taken and so on. So there needs to be a basic regulatory structure and I think a lot of these Republicans don't want that. And so I think what, what's likely to happen is if they move in that direction in a much more free market direction, they're literally going to show that choice doesn't work. Hmm. And, and I think in a lot of people's minds, choice is a thing. Either you have choice or you don't have choice. Well, that's not true. There are many different ways to design a choice system. Some are going to be much more successful than others. Right? The aim of a choice system, in my view, is to structure it in such a way that choice and competition works in the way we want them to work. And for f more free market types, it's you just create a free market system and wish everybody good luck. And I think that's a formula for disaster. So that's my first optimistic uh, component. I, I, I missed that one. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the, the second is turning to Democrats. You know, when it comes right down to it, Democrats are defenders of the existing system. That's true not just for education, but for most systems. They created them, and now they're defending them, right? And even if they're performing badly, they're defending them. Um, and that's because there are powerful political pressures due to the vested interests 
of uh, recipients and others, people who hold jobs in those institutions, and uh, they're not in a position to be real, you know, change agents when it comes to any kind of policy reform, but especially uh, education reform, right? So uh, I, I think that uh, given the nature of the times, I think it's unlikely that Democrats are going to aggressively pursue school choice. Uh, and I think it's also unlikely that they're going to aggressively pursue um, accountability because of the teachers' unions. And so basically, what are the Democrats going to do? You know, and I, I would be very surprised if they get aggressive and demand that we have a transformation of this system to provide the best possible system for children. They're tied to the existing system and to tweaks to it and to providing more money to the system and more pay for teachers and so on, things that make everybody in the system happy, but that doesn't do anything to restructure the system to provide a system that's better organized for children. So I just don't see any avenue for major change. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, you know. It is what it is. Matthew, yeah. how about you? So I return to a more optimistic posture. Um, so one of the things that uh, I learned over the last year, my, my continuing scholarship, um, I've been looking at charter schools for the last 15 years, and I always wondered why we had this distribution of quality. And we've talked about the fact that there's a bunch at the low end that we should do something about. But really the focus of my, my new insight is that uh, at the top end of the quality distribution in the charter school world, there are hundreds of charter schools that are literally knocking it out of the park. Mm -hmm. We've heard about Success Academy. They're, they're not alone. So my research has found hundreds and hundreds of these. And they're not talking to each other. They're all in their own little pockets. And what that tells me is two things. One, we have a really strong evidence proof that we can do education differently. And if we leverage that fact in a really important and, and persistent way, I think we bleed into the mainstream to say, here are great schools. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. And so I do think that there will be pressure put on established systems to prove in that they can do better. Um, and the second thing is that that evidence proof, that group of schools, is only able to do what they do because they got the choice flexibility. Mm -hmm. The charter bargain is that they get to do whatever they want to for a period of time. And not everybody does that well, as we see by the distribution of quality. But you only get these beautiful examples of stellar education and innovation because you've got this, this opportunity to experiment. And so I think more schools are going to want that opportunity and are willing to, will be willing to take the risk that they might not do well. We see districts around the country starting to allow schools to do that kind of experimentation. It may not be pure choice, but it's certainly the flexibility to try things in a more choice-like manner. And so I'm optimistic that that small cluster of really, really stellar schools has a catalytic effect. It may not permeate the entire system, but I think it's certainly going to move down into the system in ways that we haven't yet seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, there, there are two microphones here for when we uh, go to questions in a moment, so come on down. Um, optimistic. Eric, optimistic or pessimistic? So I alternate when I get up in the morning whether I'm optimistic <laughs> or pessimistic. Um, what, what this discussion leads to is that on my pessimistic days, I'm optimistic relative to Terry. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the optimistic side is that there are a number of forces that I think are pushing to change the system. There's a lot of inertia in the system, but there is um, a Supreme Court decision called Janus that might have a huge impact on teachers' unions because it says that if anybody is a teacher and doesn't want to join the union, they don't have to pay the union. Um, the unions are not the only force of inertia in the system. There are lots of other uh, employees of the system that like the current system. They've got a job there and they like it. Um, on the other hand, we have 
personalized learning coming in. If you sit in Silicon Valley for a little while, you see the most exquisite kinds of um, technology uh, to aid teachers. So we haven't quite figured out how to get into the classroom yet, but there are really signs of um, very uh, interesting and productive things. I also see that there are some leaders in the country that really want change. And so you see different school systems that all of a sudden move ahead. I mean, the pessimistic side of that is that it's not institutionalized, that it's individualized changes. But I can see places where this is happening. So there's a constant struggle between my optimistic and pessimistic side. But th the optimistic side has a real chance, I think, of succeeding over the next decade or two. Um, and that's what we should be looking for. I feel better. Question time. Um, everybody says this, I mean it. Ask a question. Uh, if you can't get to your question within 30 seconds, I'm moving on. And, and do us the kindness of introducing yourself. And if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, then please direct it. Ma'am. Anara Simpson, I'm an educator here in Silicon Valley. And um, my question is, what are your thoughts on technology? Um, in the last 20 years, the biggest thing that's changed is tech, right? So that should affect how we educate our kids. And um, we talked about teachers and we talked about unions and I'm not sure why we talked about Democrats and Republicans, but anyway. Um, the big thing is, if we don't do well in math, right, and the basic sciences, we're done, we're toast, and teachers cannot teach the way that the schools are set up now, whether it's in you know, really good charter schools or, so the question is, um, we have the tools at our disposal. For example, Khan Academy allows you to do algebra using computers, and it's personalized learning. So that means that if I'm not mastering Right. So the question is? The question is, if we have personalized learning available today uh, with like Khan Academy, where they won't let you go to calculus if you can't master algebra, which is super important, um, shouldn't we be encouraging to use that? Because we do live in a very technology world, and everybody um, has some connection to the who, internet. Who wants to take a bash at that? Go ahead. Well, I'll take part of it. Um, I think there are two parts to your question. One is. By the way, I'm we, holding the panelists accountable for short answers, yeah, too. Should we pay attention to whether kids have learned something before we pass them on, which is somewhat independent of technology? And I think that there the answer is yes, and, and there there is a technology that's helping us by providing information about what kids learn. On the side of whether technology helps teaching, I think we've made some fundamental mistakes so far in the way we've introduced technology. And that is some uh, district procurement officer decides this approach, this bit of technology is going to work and we're going to give it to everybody whether they like it or not mm -hmm. and make everybody use the same technology. And my own view of teaching is that it's a very complicated thing. Some people can teach one way, some people can teach another way and get the same results. Some people can use technology of a certain type effectively, others can't. And it's getting the match of the technology with the people that can use it effectively and not those that uh, can't use it effectively that is the real um, stumbling block right now that we haven't passed. And my own answer is I'd like to see us spend more time looking at technology to save teachers time as opposed to teacher-proofing classrooms, but I don't hear anybody working on that. Sir. So I'm Bill Evers. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution. So my question is directed to Terry Moe, and I wonder if you could revisit the emphasis that you place on Republican extremism uh, in light of uh, some evidence that I would just like to suggest. So if I look at the Trump transition for the U.S. Department of Education, which I headed, the views are the same views as those of you in front of me and the views of the correct task force. If I look at the appointed political bureaucrats in the US Department of Education under the Trump administration, the views are the same as you on the stage 
account of the Caret Task Force. If I look at Lamar Alexander, who wrote the revision of the Federal Aid to Education Act, he is a moderate Republican. Now, granted, there was some stepping back from perhaps a utopian hope <clears throat> that we could do some central planning of education from Washington, D.C., but it, it didn't work out that well. So, but the main thing that Mackie Raymond and Rick Hanyashek have said, which is that we get data about schools and about students and about teachers, and that, that gives us leverage. That is still there. These Republicans, the that question you're calling is, <laughs> could you please revisit the point you made about the heavy weight of ex supposed extremism on the part of the Republicans? The president has embraced why, I choice. I think the question is, why is that evidence not persuasive to you? Yeah. I mean, the president has embraced Let's choice. Give Jerry a chance to have, have an answer. <clears throat> All right. I think um, Republicans have definitely moved far right compared to the way they were in the past. That move involves, among other things, um, uh, uh, a belief in extreme deregulation. Take a look at what's happening throughout the government, like at the EPA. No, but in education. Well, uh, look, I'm, this is a government-wide thing where you have Republicans in position of responsibility and a president who is taking pride in radical deregulation. Right? And I think that many Republicans now are very much committed to free market economics in a pure sense, right, without regulation, right? And I think that those are precisely the kinds of people who tend to favor the kinds of charter systems or voucher systems that Betsy DeVos uh, symbolizes and has been really criticized for and has scared uh, Democrats and others away from supporting school choice. This is a, uh, if I can make a recommendation, a programming recommendation, I, I would sit in the front row for a debate between Professor Evers and Professor <laughs> Moe on this very topic. So I, I mean that earnestly. I'd love to listen to that. Sir. Uh, question, Barry Smith. Uh, this was uh, very depressing. Um, <laughs> We're so sorry. <laughs> so since we don't have anything going for the next two decades in the U.S., which country mm. are you most <laughs> impressed with their education system and what are you impressed by what they do? Hmm. That's a great question. Well, internationally, the uh, East Asian countries are way ahead of, of the U.S. Um, when we look, uh, there are also some European countries that are doing very well. Finland was the leader, but it's fallen back recently. If you look across the uh, world at different systems, you see that there's very little in common of the really good systems and the really bad systems. One thing might be um, uh, that the best systems tend to have good at testing and accountability systems, uh, at least for um, high school exit uh, exams. And the uh, best systems do tend to have a little bit more choice in terms of where they go um, than others, but it's not something that will explain the whole differences. Um, I think it's uh, these countries tend to focus on performance of their schools in one way or another, and they've got the society to think about the performance, not necessarily in terms of precise test scores, but their country is focused on performance. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Mary Cooper, and I'm an interested community member, and I'm, my question goes to you. Okay. Um, could you tell us the states, because you, you mentioned the success, and you were very um, optimistic with the number of charter schools that you've seen are really doing well. What parts of the country, where are they, and what are the demographics of those ones that are doing so well? And I mean ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your question. Um, so the study that I'm talking about um, is one that I'm going to be bringing forward in a few weeks in a, in a paper. And what I found was that the states that have the highest 
most rigorous criteria for actually getting a charter in the first place, so a high barrier to entry that's based on a plan, all of these are just a plan at that point, that looks like it's going to be a coherent school system. That's important. And unapologetic application of accountability at the end of the charter term so that they are, they are living up to the bargain of flexibility for accountability. The schools that we found uh, that are really exceptional, I was surprised to find how diverse the student populations are in those schools. Specifically, more than 50% of those kids were low income and more than 70% of those kids were minority in the schools that did well. Now this is taking all those schools together. I would have expected those really high flyer schools to be the suburban charter school in Scottsdale, Arizona, right? Well, mm -hmm. they do well, good for them. But the majority of those schools are the kind that go into really challenged communities. And they go in with the mission of trying to produce really strong outcomes for kids. And they're just really focused on that mission. And that's what they deliver. So I've been very um, uplifted by finding those schools because they do show that well, it's possible. Where are they, Mackie? Name some names. Can't. Kip? No, can't. Can't? Oh, you can't. You're, you're we can't. Uh, author's prerogative. We, we do not name schools. I see. Sorry. But, but, but wasn't the question about geographic areas? So uh, places like Massachusetts, OK? Places like uh, New York State and New York City, very serious about closing bad schools. Uh, you've got Michigan which has a huge diversity of, of charter, school, uh, charter school authorizers in the state, but they have a common understanding about what it takes to get a charter in the state. So they have very strong entry requirements. So, and is it also not true, oh, it's still true, correct, that urban charters as a class tend to be the bright shining stars of the reform yes. era? Yes, as a group. They, they outperform the district schools with whom they co-compete. Uh, by substantial margins. So if we're looking for optimism or reasons to be optimistic, it's never been, I won't put words in your mouth, tell me if I've got this wrong, it's probably a better time to be a low-income person of color in a major urban center in America today than ever before. From a probabilistic from a, standpoint? From an, edu from an education standpoint, in terms of your likelihood of getting into a good, high-performing charter school. <laughs> that's, a, that's a no. That's, that's, that's a, I'm going to take that as a no. There's a huge supply constraint. If there were enough high quality charter seats to address the demands in those areas, I would absolutely say yes. But there are lots of reasons why it's diff more difficult to open charter schools in those communities. And that's because of part of the pushback that, that Terry was talking about. Got it. Sir. Hi. Hi, uh, William Condon. I'm also I'm a graduate student with the uh, University of Georgetown Democracy and Governance. I'm also a military advisor for the Marine Corps Reserves. My question is, I know we spoke about uh, teaching universities and accreditation programs, and I know nobody wants to be the first patient of a brand new surgeon, so for the children <laughs> in those classes, when new teachers enter schools, uh, what about the development of mentor programs and especially uh, teaching administrators who will evaluate teachers more effectively in those first initial years of teaching and essentially make the call on their competency in the future? In specific instances, it works. Um, and specific mentoring programs, particularly as evaluated by the people who develop these programs, they're very good. What we've had trouble doing is finding ways to expand these programs widely and to build them up so that we, um, when we try to institute broad mentoring programs, the state requires men mentors or, or what have you, they don't quite work. Um, we also know that there is a very large difference in the quality of principals, uh, about the same as the difference in the quality of teachers. What we don't know is, or don't have a system, is to ensure that we have good principals in all of these schools so that good principals can have a huge impact both on their own teaching and uh, maybe on other schools if they drive the bad teachers to some other school. But um, uh, we don't have the structure to ensure that we get 
good principals in all the schools. And so this is a, a statement that it's not all teachers' unions that are the problem, because in general, principals aren't unionized. And we could have systems that made better choices, and somehow we're not getting those good choices. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Ariana Farber. I'm a graduate student at the University of Utah here at the Public Policy Boot Camp. Okay. I'm wondering what the role is of school vouchers or having the dollars follow the student. You sort of structured it as though there was a choice, but a choice between charter schools and public schools. So does that factor in at all in your opinion, or what is the role of that? Well, there are countries around the world where the money does follow with the child. And so for example, in the Netherlands, that, that check goes to wherever the parents choose to place the student, whether it's in homeschooling or whether it's in a private school or a public school or whatever, a religious school. Um, and they tend to do pretty well. Um, but, and here's the difference between vouchers in our country and that kind of a system there, um, they are very, very strict about regulating quality across the entire set of schools. And so they are very quick to remove creditation for schools that are underperforming. And they do have a pretty rigorous set of evaluations that they go through on a triannual basis. That's not what we do. We allow schools to decide whether they will accept vouchers. And so, and those vouchers have to be the full amount of tuition mm. that the school accepts. And so the very best private schools are not accepting voucher students. They're not participating in the voucher program at all. Um, and the proportion of seats that a school makes available to vouchers can vary widely. And so in many cases, private schools become dependent on the voucher. That's their, basically their lunch ticket. And if that was coupled with a really, really strong quality assurance program, I would be more optimistic about it. I think that ultimately we will get to a point where dollars will follow children but there will be guardrails around what parents can do with those dollars. Uh, and I think they will be, guard, they will be guardrailed by certain quality assum assumptions that you can take that dollars, those dollars and move forward, but you have to move forward to a place that's high quality in order to really use those dollars effectively. You know, let me just add one thing. <laughs> There's a uh, publication by Ed Choice called the ABCs of it's Choice. Choice. And they list all the choice systems in every state and, and describe them. And uh, one of the things that you notice if you look at all the voucher programs, and there's something like 45 of them in this country, is that the amount of the voucher is tiny, mm. right? And I mean, you know how much private schools cost. The, the typical voucher to go to a private school is about $5,000. All right, you know, what kind of private school are you going to be able to get into if the private school is willing to accept that as full tuition? And so all the evidence that we have about how well voucher systems perform is contingent upon those underlying regulations that determine uh, which schools want to get in to do that. And these are not going to be the highest quality schools. Great. Sir, welcome. Hello, my name's Reese. Sorry. I'm a Bay Area native, and I actually did my elementary education in Palo Alto right here. Um, I consider myself very fortunate to have had that experience. It prepped me very well for my master's degree. In undergrad, what it did not prep me very well for when I went to college were adult skills, such as how to sign a lease, or even more importantly, what it would mean taking out a student loan to continue my education and how that would impact me now at age 35 to buy a home and do some other things. My question is, do you think elementary education needs to start educating students not just how to become better students, but also how to become adults? And is there any data out there that suggests that, um, I guess my opinion isn't uh, alone, that others um, feel similarly? Everyone's well, looking to me as the elementary school teacher. Not right? to put you on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, oy, um, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, 
my strong sense is that we're already asking elementary schools, because uh, you're focused on elementary schools. I'm not sure. K through 12. Okay, K through 12. Well, uh, elementary school is the wrong place for that. Elementary school is, uh, has too many burdens already, and where th three out of four, two out of three kids are not proficient in reading, we need to focus on that, not on, on, a, on adult skills. I'm, I'm out of my depth on, on the larger areas. So there's a large movement today to talk about developing social emotional mm -hmm. skills and a variety of other skills. Um, I think that uh, it's hard to argue against that. And when you're in a workplace, you know, it pays to have people that can get along with each other and, and that are diligent and so forth. The answer still comes down to if they can't do read and can't do math, it doesn't matter how good they are interpersonally uh, for the most part on average and that this is not a substitute. Um, it is not entirely clear how good schools are at teaching social emotional skills or how much we should ex expect from them. I think these are all research experimental questions but that they in my mind pale next to the idea that an eighth grader should be able to read a book. So I'll weigh in in one, way, one small way. Um, I think that's exactly the body of information that would be excellent for an app. Like Real Life 101, 595 on the Apple Store. Anybody who takes that idea and develops it, you heard it first here. <laughs> but literally, I mean, that's a, that's a concrete set of information and skills that could be really well used mm -hmm and adapted in a, in a technology and in, a, in an app environment. So I would say that that's an opportunity for somebody in Silicon Valley yeah. in concert with educators to, to develop and make available and be hopefully extremely successful. Adulting.com. I think we have time for one last question before we have to wrap up. Thank Sir. you, I have actually two. Recognizing that uh, the best education we can give our kids is our personal responsibility and it's the best thing for our country how do we get the damn politicians to agree that it's nonpartisan? That's the first one. Second one, in the whole discussion, I really didn't hear much about the parents' role in education. And recognizing that a lot of kids don't have that backup at home, what can we do to have this, providing them help for that? Thank you. Terry, you had talked about the bipartisan consensus being breached. Is it coming back? Can it come back? <laughs> Um, I know you're pessimistic. Anything can happen, right? <laughs> uh, but look, uh, in, in a polarized environment, um, it, it's, it's very likely uh, that, that it won't it will come together. I think the Republicans and Democrats see the education system very differently. The Democrats really are wedded to the existing system, uh, all the vested interests uh, of this system that are protecting it powerfully are wedded to the Democratic Party. Um, uh, the Republicans have uh, completely different uh, ideological interests when it comes to the education system. Um, and there are very few issues uh, on which I think that their interests can overlap. So for the foreseeable future, it's, I mean, we all have this idea that if we could just cooperate, you know, <laughs> But uh, it doesn't happen that way nowadays in politics. It used to happen that way, and you know, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Uh, but this is a very different time, and we really, in my view, have a political system that does not work. It doesn't work to produce the kind of legislation and policies that are actually good. Uh, for the American people, what we tend to get is nothing. Hmm. And I'll just have a bash of the parenting question really quickly because it's a major theme of the book that I just wrote. Uh, it's another thing Success Academy does quite well is, is they make prodigious demands of parents. Uh, maybe some would even argue uh, too many demands on, on parents. Um, I would argue that uh, the soft bigotry of expectations is no longer applied to students, but many of us in this work, wittingly or unwittingly, apply it to parents, and I think that's a mistake, and that's my own hope for the next 20 years that we can change that. Um, before we wrap up, I'm gonna ask one last question, uh, quick answer. Um, 
Right now, the, I don't know what the data is, 85, 90% of American children still attend a zoned public school. Uh, it is by far the dominant paradigm of, of schooling in America. Uh, if we're sitting on this stage or our children and grandchildren are sitting on this stage 50 years from now, is that still going to be true 50 years from now? I think absolutely it's going to be. Schools are such an important part of the fabric of communities. They are the gathering place. They are the, the place to celebrate the transition of generations. It's socially and, and it's sort of uh, emotionally the heartbeat of, of community and I don't see that going away. What I do see happening is that there's a much greater focus in the next 20 years on making sure that wherever the school is in whatever community it is that students who are enrolled there have the same opportunities for getting good education as they would if they got into a car and drove across town. So I think that community school is still the, the binding model but I think the challenge here is to make sure that all students from an equity standpoint and from effectiveness standpoint are served equivalently. Eric, you agree? I think so. I mean, what all of the evidence on that we have suggests is that parents value a close school so that if they even have options uh, that are look better, at least to us, uh, far away, they tend to gravitate to the local school for partly the reasons that Mackey is bringing up and partly because it's a convenient thing as opposed to all of us who know the evils of commuting to work, <laughs> commuting to school is the same kind of thing. So I anticipate the central location being the uh, local school. I anticipate also that there are going to be more and more ways to get schooling outside of that school through technology and other ways so that it breaks it up in some sense in terms of the learning versus the community aspects. So let me just add quickly to that. I, I think that um, there are many reasons that the existing public schools will, will stay. I mean, for instance, in Palo Alto, there, there's no move to have a lot of school choice. I mean, people move here for the public schools, and it's that way in many communities. On the other hand, I, I think Republicans are in the business of proliferating choices. Uh, uh, and I think with uh, technology, they'll do the same thing. Um, and so I, I think what we're going to have in the future is a lot more choices, uh, but they'll be adopted uh, right along with the, with the regular public schools. And what we'll see is some kind of um, new equilibrium where where some people in the regular public schools move out to these other choices. And my worry is that the kinds of people who are adopting these new choice systems will not regulate them in a way uh, that makes sense for society and there could be some uh, negative consequences. Very good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. What, what a great turnout. And please join me in thanking our panelists. <clears throat>